Yo, it's Famicom here again, and today I figured I wanted to do a sort of video diving into just one uh, specific gyro issue. Um, and the reason why is because this one here is one of my favorite. It is a 1972 February uh, issue with a cover page, a cover art by Sasaki Maki. Um, which is kind of interesting because there's actually no Sasaki stories in this entire um, issue, which is a little bit weird, but that's fine. A very iconic cover in my opinion. Very colorful and playful and nonsensical as Sasaki is. But I just wanted to do a flip through of each of the stories in here. Some are standalone stories and some are um, continuations of different stories. So let's take a look at the table of contents. So we have a Nagashima Shinji story, Mizuki Shigeru, Roichi Ikigami, um, not too sure who that is, Tsuge Tarao, uh, Susumu, Katsu Susumu Katsumata, and then I think that is a Furukawa something, Fujisawa Mitsuo, Oji Suzuki. So a very, very stacked um, issue. But yeah, let's get started. The very first story is chapter five of, I believe this is translated to the story of Four and a Half Mats by Shinji Nagashima. It's a cover, uh, a color page entry. So because this is chapter five of the story, I can't really say what the story itself is about. Um, I'll do a little flick through. So at this moment, I have read a couple of Nagashima stories over the course of my Gara reading journey. And um, what I really love about his works, he's done a couple of like uh, folktale adaptation, uh, adaptations in some of the Gara issues. I did write a, a blog post on one of them uh, on I think it was, uh, I forgot the name of it exactly, but, ah, oh, Furuya no Mori, that is the, the name of um, the folktale that Nagashima adapted. That one is about um, a, a thief and a wolf trying to infiltrate a, a villager's house, but they get scared by the mysterious Furuya no Mori, which translates to a leak in an a leak in an old house, but they miss here, and um, there's this whole thing about that. It's, it's a it's an old tale, but that one's really cool, and he does a lot of other um, folktale adaptations as well. So yeah, that's the first story from Nagashima. Then next, we've got uh, one by Mizuki Shigeru, chapter 17. Um, I don't know what this is about. I do believe it follows... Actually, I won't say because, yeah, I'm not too confident on it, but... I think this is Hoshi Otsukami Sokoneru Otoko. I'm not sure what that means, but I'll do a flip through of it anyways. But yeah, this is a long running series of Mizuki's. Great art, as always. Amazing backgrounds. But yeah, we'll just slowly flick through some of the pages. It's kind of funny seeing the contrast of these faces to very detailed backgrounds, which is, I guess, I think, um, a Mizuki trademark. Well, you can see it in a lot of his works. Very, very detailed backgrounds. And sometimes whimsical characters. All right. So, third story. Chapter one of Owen no Koi by Goichi Ikegami. And so I've read maybe three chapters of this throughout the various Gara issues. Uh, but this first chapter follows Owen, who is here with her son. And what happens is a giant fire breaks out in the neighborhood uh, to start things off. So you can see it here amazing 
double page spread. And we go through and the narrator sort of documents what happens in the fire. Which I believe um, is explained that this was an actual event um, in history. So I'm not entirely sure what specific name the disaster had, but I believe it's explained to be a true event that the story is based on. So we have Owen and her son escaping from the fire. Very, very uh, chaotic sequences here. Everyone's running. Always love the detail in Ikigami's art, especially looking at... I'll bring it up closer. The facial expressions. You can see how many people are, like, packed in that bridge. Very, very strong and expressive uh, facial expressions. And we end off with a cliffhanger for the first chapter of a mysterious man saving Owen and her son. And the story continues from there. What I do know is that something happens or her, um, Owen's husband has something to do with this whole drama with this man here. Not exactly sure what, but that is all I know at the moment at least. But yeah, can't go wrong with um, Ikegami. And next, here is, I translated this, I guess, as, um, Cora Cliff, so Cliff named Cora or something like that, by, I believe this is pronounced Ryuzan Aki. I have never heard of, um, Aki before, but it's quite a short one here. Quite an interesting layout and panel sequence as well. Um, so essentially this man here, he used to be a sailor, or at, at least he was in the past. He was with um, all of these crewmates here on a boat. And what had happened was that uh, the boat capsized and all of the crewmates died except for him. And he still sees some of their faces in the trees, so it's like regret, trauma, that sort of thing. And yeah, we get some um, some recollection of that. But whenever he visits this cliff, he sees that tree, and from a distance he notices this shadow, which is revealed to be the skeletons of all of his dead crewmates. And the story ends there. So quite a brief one, looking at trauma and thinking back to the past of um, his dead crew. So yeah, interesting style as well. I really love how like the, the, the leaves are shown here. They're like, they look like asterisks. But yeah, next, I can't show the first page, but a story by Tani Hiroji, who did Guns N' Roses, um, and has put out some other stuff as well, but this is a, I believe, a continuation of a story, so I don't really know too much about what goes on here, but Guns N' Roses was an interesting read. I wouldn't say it was my favorite read, but it was definitely an interesting one. So yeah, great art though, um, and Hiroji has also put out some stuff in, in Axe too, at least from the early issues that I've read. So yeah, quite a, a captivating art style, I would say. Very dreamlike at times too.
But yeah, just in terms of Gaara in general, the, the main thing I love about Gaara is the variety. Even just having one, just having one issue of Gaara gives you so many stories and you could honestly just flick through it for, for hours. But yeah, that was the Hidoji story. Then you have some adverts and essays. So we'll move on past those into a Tsuge Tarao story, which is titled, at least when I translated it, An Absurd Story. But before we actually get into it, let's take a look at what it looks like in the English version. So that story appears in the Drawn in Quarterly's uh, English book of trash market for Tarao. And what's very helpful is that you have which issues the stories come from. So it's this one here, A Tale of Absolute and Other Nonsense. Garo, Feb, 1972. So let's flick over to this. Um, I really love this uh, this book here. Um, I only started reading Tado quite recently, so I'm not an expert on him. But let's just flick to the start. Here we go. Tale of, a, a Tale of Absolute and Other Nonsense, translated by Ryan Holmberg essentially following a group of uh, activists, student activists and protesters um, going through uh, the contextual, uh, the period of the protests at that time in post-war Japan. But most of the story does center on uh, the conflict that happened. So the physical fights and the actual violence that happens in the protest itself so i'll just flick over and here show some pages from the violent side of things this was one of the very first um stories that i had read from tarawa and i was immensely impressed with how raw his works are so there you go yeah so that's just what it looks like in English version, but let's flick through the original. The original um, serialization in Gal. So I believe, I have to check, we'll, we'll come to it too later in the issue, but there apparently was a censoring of this story that was discussed in the Holmberg essay in Trash Market. So I do have to check that, but yeah, I I feel that Tuttle's strongest, um, like the, the strongest thing that Tuttle has for his stories is his art, which is, you know, maybe a bit contradictory because Tuttle himself, he, he has stated before that he doesn't like his art and feels like it's uh, underdeveloped. But I feel that especially when it comes to scenes like these, very violent scenes, it complements it very well. It's rough and raw, like these scenes would be in real life. So I do very much appreciate his art style, although it's quite different from his brother Yoshiharu, who has more, more detailed artwork. I still very much love the way he approaches his stories and how he showcases facial expressions, body movements, and the action in this. You can sort of feel every hit, every stab. And it's quite a sad, sad ending to the story. They're trying to storm, I believe it's the Emperor's castle. And there we go, yes. So, this last panel here was supposed to be, um, I believe, the, the Emperor um, lifting his hat or something. I'm not too sure, I'm not knowledgeable on the contextual part of this. But let's show what it looks like, or what it was supposed to look like in 
um, the English version, which didn't censor it. There we go. So that's the same, but this last panel is that image there. So that was interesting, looking at the censorship of um, that panel, which um, Taro said he wasn't really too bothered by in the interview at the end of Trash Market at least, but um, there was another person that was a bit bothered by the censorship, but yeah, there we go. So, that was Taro. Moving on to Susumu Katsumata. Semi-documentary um, about, I believe it's like a, a, a retelling of how there were some cats found within um, a, a laboratory that the, the character was working on. I'm not sure if the character is supposed to be Susumu himself um, because it is titled semi-documentary or semi-documentary. Oh yeah, there we go. Cats being found in the roof of the laboratory. There they are, all dirty, but still cute. And you see, they found a lot of fleas. So, not much happening in this story, but it's quite cute. It's quite cute. And yeah, that's the end of that, all buddy. Quite a simple story. Quite a simple story, to be honest. Okay, and then we move on to a story by Tatsumi Yoshihiro. And oh, I forgot how to read this. I'll put the name of this in the description. But I do not believe that this story is in any of the English releases of Tatsumi's work. It's not in Pushman. I don't think it's in any of the other stories. But it follows a mangaka, this man, who sort of debates with himself whether to go back to visit his parents and what to do with his career. Um, and later on, I'll show a um, the Yoshihiro special issue of Garo as well, because if you didn't know, Garo does these um, special issues where the entire issue is just focused on one author, one mangaka, and only has stories from that mangaka. And those ones are the hardest to get out of all of the, uh, like the entire catalogue of Garo, um, especially if the mangaka is very well known very famous um but yeah that was a the story there so i'll open up now the tatsumi special issue so every single um story in this one is all by tatsumi there you go and you've got some color pages as well very glorious color pages. I haven't read much of Tatsumi's work, to be honest, yet. I've read Pushman, which was, um, yeah, it was good, but just a little bit too short. I know all of those stories had like a, a page limit, and that's why they were all short, um, but I prefer Tatsumi's longer stories, to be honest. So yeah, I believe this first one is called Scorpion. I can do a, another video on this a later time because I haven't read this one yet, but might as well just flick through some of the amazing art. Kawaita Kawara Michi. No. Wakare Michi. My bad. Ah, oh, I've seen this panel before. It's on one of his special issue tanko bonds, I believe. Short story collections. Love that panel. But yeah. That's the Tatsumi special issue, which in the future I'll have time to read and then I can probably go through it. But he is a legend in 
the manga scene. Yeah, there you go. Special issue of Tatsumi. Now, coming back to our 1972 issue, who do we have left? So we'll skip over. Some essays. And we arrive at Oji Suzuki, which this translates to Highway Town? Yeah, Highway Town. Okay, so Oji Suzuki, I've only read one Tangled one from, um, which I'll show later as well. I have it on me. And I do believe that this story is translated in English in the. Um, uh, what was the name of it? I don't remember the name of the English uh, book that was put out from for for Suzuki, but this story broke me. It it, it was a hard one to to get through uh, because of how sad it was. Um, but yeah, essentially we follow this woman Kyoko, who pretty much has a very sad simple life she gets taken advantage of because she's a little bit um slow and it to me when i was reading this it was a very quiet story you know, kyoko is by herself she doesn't have anyone close to her no family um, she was born from an affair that a, a theatre actor had with, I believe, a prostitute and was just abandoned. And her entire life has just been a downhill journey. And it is a very, it's a very heavy story. It's a very heavy story. And to this day, I still think that these two pages here are uh, one of the most harrowing pages I've seen from manga because you have Kyoko on her deathbed and the detail that is shown with her face is just so sad and it sort of fades. She fades into the darkness as her body gives up and while while transitioning and you know while she she's lo losing all the energy she focuses on the stars and it's a really sad really sad um sort of narration or dialogue from her but if you can see there there is a single tear that floats down her cheek ah oh, man a very heavy story a very heavy story so, because of that, Suzuki has shot up my list of favorite Gekiga mangaka. Uh, although, some of these stories are sort of hard to, to understand. They are very cryptic and surreal, which I'll show here. So, this is the tangled one I read. Autobai Shoujo, which means motorcycle girl. And I'll just flick through some of the panels here. Love the art style, but very random and strange things happening throughout the story. So yeah, while I don't really understand much of um, Suzuki's storytelling, I love the atmosphere and the vibe and how, you know, when I, when I think of these stories, they are very memorable. Like you have this very brutal scene interposed, wait, interposed, not a word, uh, interwoven through other scenes of daily life. And it's sad, you know, it makes you feel a little empty, but it's a very strong style of storytelling. And I do want to find a certain panel, yeah, here. Very weird, um, having like this hand reach out and metaphorically 
or figuratively restart the man um, as he's walking. But yeah, very weird things happening, but I still love the stories that he creates. So that was Motorbike Girl. And now we're nearing the end of the issue. So this is a story called um, Shining Dream by Fujisawa Mitsuo. Very first chapter I've ever read from him. And essentially it's a, a guy who has a very uh, erotic and strange dream with very random things happening. Can't explain it. There is no story anyways. It's just the dreamscape of this guy. Random roosters, weird malformed people. But the art is amazing. There you go. All right, and I believe this one is the last story for the issue um, who is, well, which is by the founder of Mandarake. So Furukawa, uh, I always forget his name. I always forget his name. Furukawa something. Again, I'll chuck it in the description. But um, from what I've seen, he does very short stories. And someone's just following a, uh, a duo here, a woman and a boy as they traverse the land on boat, exploring. I really love the, oh man, like just everything in Ingaro, in Ingaro is just, in terms of the art, so fun to flick through and look at. So hopefully this persuades you to buy some Garu issues. Even just one Garu issue is amazing. Like just from this, you know, it's stacked. There are so many stories and so many great manga just in one issue alone. And you are holding a, a piece of manga history. That in itself is just amazing to think about how, you know, 1972, this book is what? 50, one years old 51 wait am i doing maths right 30 yeah 51 years old and to this day the story is still uh the, the book is very well kept like although it smells although it has a little bit of yellowing very much still readable like no visible cracks or dents or anything some of them do have but this one was kept very well which is Insane. 50 years. 50 years of this book being in existence. And it's in such great quality for its age. So, there you go. That is a full flip through of the 1972 February issue of Garo. One of my favorite issues of all the issues that I've read. And very, very stacked in terms of the artists. Uh, and manga that have stories in here. And you'll notice that, um, you know, from watching the video, the 70s have a lot of Gekiga in them, very famed Gekiga artists like Tarao, uh, Tatsumi, Hayashi, who wasn't in this, um, who wasn't in this issue, but there's plenty of other issues. Uh, Tatsumi, Suzuki, Shinichi Abe also comes in later as well, but yeah, so maybe in the future I'll do more of these like single issue um, flip throughs because they're really fun to talk about and there's just so much range in them so you know they won't be short videos and you go into depth with a lot of the stories in here. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed um, this video and I'll be back with some more fire manga and bangers to show on the channel all right thanks guys see ya